Red Bluff, California became a popular stop in the mid-1800s when people coming in search for gold wanted a base point to travel up the Sacramento River. The town grew as people settled there to profit off of the incoming miners. Gold mining eventually turned into logging, but the town never grew to be a large metropolis, having only about 9,000 residents in 1980. The town is home to the Red Bluff Roundup, the country's largest three-day rodeo. Cameron Hooker wasn't satisfied with his wife's participation in his sadistic sex acts. He decided that he needed someone else to use as a target for his violence. He needed someone who couldn't say no to him. He needed a slave. This is Monsters. Cameron Hooker was born on November 5, 1953 in Alturas, California to Harold and Lorena Hooker. He had a younger brother named Dexter. His family moved around every few years as his father chased work in construction or at lumber mills. His parents never divorced and there were no reports of violence or fighting. It was in 1969, when Cameron was 15 years old, that his parents bought a piece of property in Red Bluff, California, about an hour north of Sacramento. As a teen, Cameron didn't stand out at all. He wasn't one of the popular kids and didn't participate in social clubs or sports. He spent most of his time on his own fantasizing about tying up women and having his way with them. He obsessed about dominating over women and having her act as his obedient slave. After graduation, Cameron got a job at a local lumber mill, but his work life wasn't much different than his school life. He didn't really engage with his co-workers, he mainly kept to himself and used his time at the milling machines to daydream about BDSM, which stands for Bondage, Discipline, and Sadomasochism. It wasn't until someone introduced him to a woman named Janice in April of 1973 that he finally had someone to carry out his daydreams with. Janice Lashy, who went by Jan, was born in February of 1958 in Los Gatos, California, just south of San Francisco. Her family had moved up to Red Bluff when she was young and she was attending high school there. She was 15 years old and Cameron was 19. Her youth came with a naivety that was perfect for Cameron. He treated her well and got her attached to him before bringing up his interest in bondage. He asked her if he could tie her up in a tree and she agreed because she didn't want to lose him. Cameron took Jan out to the woods and tied her up by her wrists in a tree. She said it was painful, but afterward he treated her with a lot of love and care, which she enjoyed. He never did anything she didn't want to do, and though she didn't like any of it, she continued in order to keep him happy. She would agree to go out into the woods and let him tie her up two to three times a month. He gradually escalated the sessions to involve whipping and even tying her up and dunking her in the water. Helpless and unable to breathe, she knew she didn't like what he was doing, but besides these few times, the rest of the time he was the nicest guy she'd ever met. She endured these punishments to have the nice guy the rest of the time. Jan wanted to make sure Cameron was in as much love with her as she was with him, so she lied and told him she was pregnant. To her pleasant surprise, he asked her to marry him. During his testimony at trial, Cameron would describe the pregnancy and then say, quote, the pregnancy turned out to be false, end quote. She would eventually tell him in 1979 that she lied, and she claimed that he told her that he knew. He also explained on the stand that Jan enjoyed the BDSM, which wasn't true at all. Cameron and Janice were married on January 18, 1975 in Reno, Nevada. Jan's parents gave her permission and, at 16 years old, she dropped out of school. They moved into a rented house in Red Bluff, and based on all outward appearances, they were a normal young couple. Inside, Cameron was continuing to escalate his painful sessions. He began choking Jan until she passed out, and when they had a fight, he became violent and threatened to kill her. When he started strapping a sealed-up gas mask to her face, she finally had enough of her husband's desire to hurt her. Cameron told Jan that they should bring in another woman to use as a sort of pain surrogate. If you need a name for your metal band, you can thank me in the comments for that one. Jan agreed, and Cameron started trying to find out exactly how to find said surrogate. At first, he considered placing an ad in the back of one of the underground papers that he read, but that would cost money and only attract someone temporarily. The only way to really have a permanent slave would be to kidnap her. He made a deal that Jan could have a baby if he could kidnap a slave girl, and she agreed. 
The deal was that Cameron was not allowed to have sex with the woman. He was only supposed to carry out his sadistic acts on her and have sex with Jan. The couple moved into a new rental house on Oak Street in Red Bluff. It was a small house, but it had a basement that would be perfect for what Cameron had in mind. He got to work using scrap wood from the lumber mill and constructed a table he dubbed the rack, which had eye bolts in it so the slave could be handcuffed to the device. Also, he built what would become known as the head box. It was a heavy double-walled box with large metal hinges that went over a person's head and could be locked shut. Cameron and Jan had their first child, a daughter named Charity, in the fall of 1976. Jan was thrilled, but Cameron was still searching for his slave girl. It took almost a year, but Cameron got his wish on May 19, 1977. After work, he went home, loaded his wife and daughter into his car, and they went out for a drive. They were on the prowl for someone to become a slave for Cameron. This is a common tactic for a kidnapper and or rapist who has a wife or a girlfriend who is willing to participate in their evil deeds. A hitchhiker is much more willing to get into a car with a couple before they get into a car with just some lone guy. Now add a baby to that mix, and the person hitching a ride will have no hesitation hopping in the car. This is exactly how Colleen Stan felt when she hopped into the car of a young family as she was hitchhiking on the overpass over I-5 that evening. A car with a family and a baby couldn't be a threat, so she accepted the ride. Unfortunately, she would soon be locked in a basement with a crazy man torturing her. Colleen Martin was born on December 31, 1956 in Riverside, California to Jack and Evelyn Martin. She had two younger sisters, Janice and Bonnie Sue, and her parents divorced not long after the youngest of the three was born. After the divorce, both parents stayed close so the children had relationships with both of them. Both her father and mother eventually remarried, giving Colleen two half-sisters and a half-brother. Colleen was described as a creative, dreamy youth who wrote poetry and made gifts for people. In a story that kind of mirrored Janice Hooker's, Colleen dropped out of high school at 16 and got married in Carson City, Nevada, with her father's permission. The marriage, which took place on December 12, 1973, was to a man named Tim Stan, who Colleen had only known for a couple of months. He was from Ohio, and the couple moved back there, but the marriage only lasted a year. They didn't get a divorce, but Colleen moved back to Riverside, where she got her GED. Back in Riverside, she seemed to have trouble finding exactly what she was looking for in life. When she became friends with a woman named Alice Walsh, her boyfriend Bob, and their two-year-old son, Tomac, they all decided to make a major change and move to Eugene, Oregon. They were able to find a place to rent, but they were having trouble finding jobs, so they were scraping by for the first few months after the move. Colleen had been dating a young man named Mark and Eugene when she decided to take a trip to Northern California to surprise her friend Linda Smith for her birthday. Linda lived in a little town called Westwood, about 85 miles or 136 kilometers east of I-5 and essentially Red Bluff. Despite pleas from her roommates and boyfriend not to go, Colleen headed out early on May 19, 1977 to hitchhike her way to Westwood. In the late 70s, a young woman hitchhiking alone was nothing new. If you didn't have a car or money for a bus ticket, the next best option was to make it to the freeway and stick your thumb up. She was first picked up by a man in a Porsche and only taken about 17 miles south on Interstate 5, but she figured it was better than nothing. Next, she was picked up by a semi-truck with two drivers. One was a man in his 40s who was driving while the younger man in his 20s was in the back sleeping. They were going all the way to Southern California and would be able to drop her off in Red Bluff where she'd need to head east on Highway 36. After a stop to drop off some of their load and then a quick lunch, they continued into California with the younger man driving. After entering California, they had to go through an inspection. They weren't supposed to pick up hitchhikers, so they had Colleen hide in the sleeper area. After they made it through the inspection station, the older man hopped into the back and started trying to kiss Colleen, but she pushed him away and jumped into the passenger seat up front. The older man didn't pursue the young woman and ended up falling asleep. The younger driver apologized to Colleen before eventually dropping her off at their agreed-upon destination. Now she just needed to make it from Red Bluff to Westwood and she'd be able to make it to Linda's house before dark. She turned down a couple of rides she didn't feel comfortable with before a blue 1971 Dodge Colt pulled over and offered her a ride, which she took because obviously a young couple with a baby couldn't have any nefarious intent, right? 
As they headed east on Highway 36, she started feeling uncomfortable as Cameron started asking her questions. He asked her where she was from, how old she was, and if she was married. She told them she was from Eugene, she was 20 years old, and that she was married but was separated from her husband. Cameron was probably most interested when he asked Colleen where she was going, and the young woman told him she was going to surprise her friend for her birthday. Cameron asked, quote, She doesn't know you're coming? End quote. To which Colleen answered no. Now Cameron knew that Colleen wouldn't be missed if she didn't show up to her destination. Even better, she was separated from her husband, so she might not even have anyone in Eugene expecting her back. Here's a safety tip for when you're traveling. Don't give strangers details of your trip. If I had a nickel for every time my wife gave out information that a stranger didn't need, I'd have enough money to hire Liam Neeson to get her back when she's inevitably taken. During the ride, Cameron pulled over to get gas and Colleen got out to use the bathroom. When she got back in the car, she noticed there was a strange wooden box in the back seat with her. It wasn't there before. Just to make it clear, it was just Colleen and her belongings in the back seat before they stopped for gas. Jan was holding the baby on her lap in the front passenger seat. You know, the 70s. They hadn't really learned about car seats and child safety yet. There were little red flags starting to go up, but since she was so close to Westwood, she brushed them off and tried to relax. About 40 miles or 65 kilometers from her friend's house, Jan asked if it was okay if they made a quick stop to check out some ice caves. Highway 36 went across the Cascade Mountains, which could possibly have some year-round ice caves. Cameron turned off the highway and up a gravel road about a quarter mile. Colleen waited in the car as the man and the woman with the baby got out of the car and walked toward a creek. After a minute, Cameron jumped into the back seat with a butcher knife and pressed it against her neck. He handcuffed her hands behind her back and put a blindfold over her eyes. Colleen said that Cameron was shaking, but he still carried out the abduction with quick precision. He put a gag in her mouth and tightened the straps around her head. The last step would explain what the wooden box in the back seat was. He opened it up and placed it down over her head. As he locked it closed, it sealed around her neck and created a dark, silent prison, where she couldn't see, hear, or even smell what was going on around her. Cameron laid her down in the back seat and covered her with the sleeping bag she was traveling with. After Jan and the baby got back into the car, they went down the gravel road and headed down the highway back toward Red Bluff. They didn't go straight to their house on Oak Street, though. They stopped at some point and had a picnic. Cameron removed the head box and let Colleen sit up while they ate, but she was eventually recovered and taken to their home. Colleen was taken down to the basement and made to stand on a recreational cooler. She was up high enough that Cameron was able to lock one hand to a bolt in the ceiling while removing her clothes. Then he switched hands and removed the last of her clothes. Once she was fully naked, he locked her other hand to the ceiling and kicked the cooler out from under her. Pain shot through her arms as all of her weight hung from her wrists. Gradually, she began having difficulty breathing. This is actually a type of crucifixion, and over time, your body weight pulling you down causes your lungs to not be able to expand as far, causing difficulty breathing. Colleen was afraid that Cameron was going to rape her, but then he left and came back downstairs with Jan. The couple stripped off their clothes and began having sex on the table in front of Colleen. When the man saw that Colleen was tilting her head back so she could see underneath the blindfold, he jumped up, grabbed a whip, and snapped it across her back. He whipped her repeatedly, telling her to stop moving. She was finally able to force herself to stop flailing long enough for him to stop. Eventually, he put a smaller box under her feet. Not one that was big enough for her to stand on fully, but she could stand on her toes and get minor relief on her wrists. When the sadist was finished having sex with his wife, he put the cooler back under Colleen's feet and unhooked her from the ceiling. Then he led her into a crate. He locked her ankles to one side of the crate and then her wrists to the other. Then he put the head box back onto her. The opening of the head box was slightly smaller than Colleen's neck, so it caused a constant sensation of being strangled. Cameron also tied a cord around her waist and pulled it tight, making it that much harder to breathe. This was where Colleen spent her first night in captivity. It would be her first night of many. The following morning, Cameron came into the basement and removed Colleen from the crate. He placed her onto the rack. 
He locked her wrists to bolts at the top of the rack and her ankles to each bottom corner. Then he left her there, naked, spread eagle, in the dark, cold basement with the head box still on. Later that day, Cameron and Jan came downstairs, removed the head box, and gave her a bowl of potatoes au gratin and a glass of water. She was still made to wear the blindfold while she ate. When she was done, she was allowed to use a bedpan to relieve herself, and then Camera hung her by her wrists from the rafters. When he was done with her, he put the head box back on and locked her to the rack for the night. Colleen said that the next day, he brought her two egg salad sandwiches and a glass of water, but she said she wasn't hungry, so she only ate half of one sandwich. Cameron was furious that she wasn't grateful for the food, so he hung her up from the ceiling and whipped her until she passed out. When she came to, she was put back on the rack and the sandwiches were put in front of her. Cameron asked, quote, Do you want to eat them now? End quote. Even though she had less of an appetite now, she forced down the sandwiches before her captor put the head box back on and left her on the rack. This would become a routine for a while. Once a day, Cameron would come downstairs, let her use a bedpan, give her some food and water, then, about two or three times a week, he would hang her from the ceiling and take pictures before returning her to the rack with the head box on. Colleen learned quickly that struggling or crying only got him more excited and made his torture sessions last longer. She would force herself to not show any emotion so he would get bored sooner and stop his sadism against her. Colleen had told her roommate that she would be back on May 21st. Alice was concerned when she didn't make it back by then, but she had no way of checking on her since Linda didn't have a phone. Alice considered the possibility that Colleen went further south to visit her mother in Riverside, but when she called her mother, she hadn't seen her daughter either. When Alice hadn't heard from Colleen by the 25th, she went to the Eugene Police Department to file a missing persons report. They took down the information and filed it away, but didn't make any effort to investigate. Police in the 70s weren't any more concerned with a missing 20-year-old than they were in 1995, or today. They assumed that she had wandered off of her own free will and played the, well, there's no proof that anything bad happened to her, card. Police do this thing where they want evidence of a crime before they investigate the disappearance of a person, but the absence of a person usually also comes with an absence of evidence. There are some people that feel this is an acceptable way to cut down on police expenses, but those people are idiots because I guarantee that as soon as one of their loved ones goes missing, they'll fully expect the authorities to hop to their feet and start investigating immediately. And they should. The first 24 hours are the most critical in a missing person's case, so I'm sorry it might cost money, but it's important. And I'm not talking about an all-hands-on-deck full search with dogs and helicopters. I mean, at least have a detective talk to the person making the report. Don't just have a rookie desk officer shrug them off. In Red Bluff, Cameron lived his life like he wasn't holding a 20-year-old woman against her will in his basement. He went to work at the lumber mill while Jan stayed home and took care of the baby. Eventually, he grabbed some particle board from work and brought it home. Cameron wasn't worried that Colleen would be able to escape, but he had grown concerned that she might be able to make enough noise for the neighbors to hear. Even more concerning, if someone came to the house, they would definitely hear noises coming from the basement if she made any. Cameron built a coffin-like box that he could keep Colleen in that would make her less able to make noise. It was about three feet tall and six and a half feet long, and the particle board was doubled up to cut down on sound. Once finished, he took the head box off Colleen and made her get inside. She was still blindfolded, so he guided her over the side and had her lay down. He put a chain around her neck and locked both of her wrists and ankles to the chain. He closed the box and latched it shut. Colleen was back in her dark, silent hell, but at least now she didn't have the head box on. The box got hot, despite Cameron's efforts to keep it cooler. He drilled a hole in each end of the box and had a hairdryer set on a low, no-heat setting, blowing into one hole to create ventilation. Now that Cameron had Colleen effectively contained, she began a long-running routine of daily bedpan use, food, and torture. The hanging and whipping was soon joined by repeated strangulation and eventually drowning. He got pleasure from watching her come within inches of dying before finally allowing her to breathe again. Due to the stress of the situation, Colleen hadn't had her period since she was kidnapped three months prior. When she finally did, Cameron got upset at her as if she had any control over it. 
She had also had some bathroom accidents inside the box, which he had to clean up, which also angered him. It's almost like he wanted to have a human being locked up in a box, but didn't have any plan to take care of their normal bodily functions. Once Cameron opened the box and saw that she was bleeding, he took her upstairs blindfolded and made her take a bath. Jan tried to brush her tangled and matted hair, but was unsuccessful, so she got a pair of scissors and cut Colleen's waist-length hair to above her shoulders. If Colleen thought this bath was an act of kindness, she would quickly be proven wrong. After she was done bathing, before the water was drained from the tub, Cameron put her on her stomach and hogtied her. Her arms and legs were up behind her back and a broom handle was placed under her legs. Cameron picked her up and placed her in the tub. The broom handle forced her legs to stay high, so her head was forced under water. Cameron would wait until she was thrashing in panic before using her hair to pull her face out of the water. He would allow her one breath before dropping her back down. He did this to her for two hours and then put her back in the box. Eventually, Cameron realized he could make money by using Colleen as free labor. He had her sand a large block of burl, which is a growth of deformed grain in a tree which can fetch a pretty penny. He also had her shell nuts and make macrame products. The hookers would sell them at a local flea market. From a legal standpoint, though, putting Colleen to work added another crime to their list of wrongs they had committed against her. Now, she was not only a kidnap and abuse victim, she was quite literally a slave. After eight months of captivity, Colleen was still unsure of why she had been taken and what Cameron's long-term intentions were. Cameron himself wasn't sure what the answers to those questions were, but when he saw an article in one of the underground newspapers he read about having someone sign a slavery contract, he knew what he wanted to do. He rented a typewriter and Jan recreated the contract he saw in the article. He had her put Michael Powers as the slave master and Janet Powers as the witness. Then he used a stencil to add the letters and calligraphy to the top of the page that read Slave Contract. On January 25, 1978, Cameron went into the basement with his contract. Colleen was in a workshop area that Cameron had built under the stairs so she could work throughout the night on whatever project they had for her. He opened the door and for the first time since her car ride, Colleen saw the face of her abductor. She was allowed to take her blindfold off after she was put in the workshop, but was normally told to put it back on before she was removed. Cameron told Colleen that someone from the company was upstairs and he was demanding that she be registered. He said that they needed to officially make her his slave and handed her the article about slave contracts. To Colleen, she was reading an article about how more and more people in the United States were becoming slaves and she didn't want to believe it, but it was clearly being reported. As far as she knew, she was reading a perfectly reputable newspaper. When she was done reading, Cameron explained that the company was a network of slave traders who had found out he was keeping Colleen captive and was demanding that he register her. Jan, who was standing next to Cameron with a bandaged knee, told her she needed to sign a contract or else the company would take her with them. Cameron then handed her the contract. It said, This indenture made the 25th day of January in the year of our Lord 1978, between Colleen Stan, hereafter known as Slave, and Michael Powers, hereafter known as Master. Witnesseth that slave, foreign in consideration, and in humble appreciation of such care and attention as Master may choose to afford her, has given, granted, aligned, enfiefed, and conveyed, and by these presents does give, grant, enfief, and convey unto Master all of slave's body and each and every part thereof without reservation, every bit of her will as to all matters and things, and the entirety of her soul, together with, all in singular, every privilege, advantage, and appurtenance to the same belongings or in any wise appertaining. Also, all the estate, right, title, interest, property, claims, ego, and id of slave in, of, and to the same, and in, of, and to every part and parcel thereof. To have and to hold, all in singular, the above described body, will, soul, and premises, with all appurtenances thereof unto master and any of his assigns forever. It went on to list that the slave agreed to comply with the master, respect the master, 
maintain her female body parts, never cross her legs in the presence of the master, never wear underwear, and vow that her only source of pleasure will come from him. Oh, and of course, declare her everlasting, unconditional dedication to serving him, obviously. When Colleen asked what would happen if she refused to sign it, Cameron answered, quote, I'll sign it for you and make you wish you had, end quote. Clearly, Cameron isn't familiar with the purpose of a contract. I mean, if you're just going to force someone to sign a contract or sign it for them, why have a contract? A contract signed due to threats or coercion isn't a valid contract. Of course, for Cameron, this was just a way to hold more power over Colleen. She now believed that the company was real and that she was now indentured to Cameron legally as his slave. He made Colleen put on a slave collar that he had made, telling her that the company required her to wear one. He explained that now he could allow her more freedom, but the company would be watching the house and monitoring the phones. If she tried to escape, the company would catch her and torture her. If she survived the torture, which was unlikely, she would be returned to him. Colleen set Cameron up to create even more fear when she asked what happened to Jan's knee. He told her that she used to be a slave who tried to escape. The company found her and tortured her until she was nearly dead. She was being held in a company facility, awaiting death when Cameron saw her and felt sorry for her, so he bought her. He said that her legs had been twisted during the torture and her knees are still affected by it. The truth was, Jan had recently had knee surgery. Colleen was told that her new slave name was K, just the letter K, and after a week, Cameron showed her a laminated card he claimed he received in the mail from the company that was her official slave registration. Though the story seemed far-fetched to most people, Colleen believed every word. She was young and had spent almost a year of sensory deprivation. Her brain was starved for information, and Colleen allowed this information to fill in the holes in her life where she had questions. To her, this story made sense and answered her questions of why she had been taken. From that point on, Colleen was allowed to go upstairs at night and do chores. She cooked and cleaned and served both Cameron, who she called Master, and Jan, who she called Ma'am. She was allowed the use of the bathroom, but she had to kneel and ask permission before going. She was given a nightgown, but at any moment, Cameron could yell, Attention! And Colleen would have to strip her nightgown off and stand on her tiptoes with her hands on the top of an arched doorway in the house. She was usually whipped as a punishment for something like not washing the dishes fast enough or not giving Jan a fork at dinner. In February of 1978, Jan wanted to test Cameron's love, so she suggested her husband bring Colleen up to their bedroom and have sex with her. She hoped that he would say no, but he jumped right up and ran to the basement like a giddy schoolboy. Once he brought his slave into their bed and began having sex with her, Jan got up and ran to the bathroom. She started throwing up and Cameron followed her. Soon he put Colleen back in the box and she wouldn't learn until much later what had actually happened. What she did know was that after that event, Jan became much more harsh with her. In April of 1978, the hookers purchased an acre of land with a small mobile home on it. Cameron transported Colleen to the new house in the middle of the night, and once they were inside, he showed her where she would be staying. He had constructed an enclosed area in the frame underneath their waterbed. There was a removable panel at the end that she could use to crawl in and out of. Then a small set of stairs that went up to the bed were placed in front of the panel. The new house meant no close neighbors, but it also meant more yard work. Eventually, Colleen was allowed outside to do yard work and work in the garden. Colleen didn't mind the work, though, as it was nice to be outside in the fresh air, and fortunately, this house didn't have a suitable place for Cameron to hang her by her wrists. That all changed once Cameron completed the construction of a small shed on the property. This became Cameron's new torture house, where he would string Colleen up by her wrists, whip her, beat her, and burn her with matches. Over time, Cameron needed more and more punishment in order to be pleased. He built a stretcher, just like the medieval torture device. He strapped Colleen into it and pulled her body tight. This would cut off the blood supply to her hands and one time caused a dislocated shoulder. Since there was nowhere to hang her inside the trailer home, he built a large wooden X that he would strap Colleen to and use an electrical cord to shock her. Rape eventually became a regular part of Cameron's routine. As the pain increased, so did Colleen's freedom. 
By Colleen's third year of captivity, the hookers had another daughter, Amber. Colleen would babysit the kids and make them meals. She was also allowed to go out running on her own. Cameron would tell her that she had 15 minutes and if she wasn't back, he'd notify the company. Cameron had convinced Colleen that one of their neighbors was a member of the company. After a different neighbor stopped her on one of her runs and began chatting with her, causing her to return late from her run, Cameron stopped letting her go running. She was eventually allowed to go out shopping and went out dancing with Jan. Other times, Cameron would send Colleen out panhandling. Eventually, Jan was told she couldn't work overtime at her job, so she got Colleen a job there. Her paycheck went straight into Cameron's bank account. These are the times that most people question why she didn't escape. As soon as she was alone, she could have gone to the police and reported Cameron. But that's only the obvious answer in our world. It wasn't that easy in Colleen's world. Cameron had effectively broken her spirit. He had conditioned her to obey his commands or else she would be punished. He had convinced her that she was being watched at all times. He would tell her stories about how other slaves tried to escape but the company found them and tortured them to death. He told her a story about one woman who escaped and found a police officer, but the officer was a member of the company and he took her back to her slave master. As punishment, she had her arms and legs amputated, she was blinded, deafened, and had her tongue cut out. Then she was hung by her hair in the slave master's bedroom. These are unimaginable horrors for a young woman who doesn't know any better. Until you've experienced Colleen's world, you can't say what she should have done. She believed that any police officer could be a member of the company. She didn't know who she could trust, and someone could be waiting to hurt her at any turn. The only thing that she could be 100% sure of was that obeying Cameron would save her from getting punished. On August 6, 1980, the entire family went to Chico, California, where Colleen watched the kids as the hookers shopped. Cameron then allowed Colleen to call her family. He told her that if she said anything to them about him or the slave contract, he would cut off the call and punish her severely back at home. He made the call from a payphone at a gas station and handed the receiver to Colleen. Colleen's sister, Bonnie, answered the phone and was surprised to hear from her sister, but after she explained that she had been staying with some friends up north, Bonnie didn't seem suspicious on the phone. They chatted for a few minutes and Cameron signaled that it was time to end the call. Colleen told her sister to tell the family she loved them and hung up. It turned out that Bonnie was suspicious. Once the call ended, Bonnie went to their dad's construction site and told him about the call. He shut the site down for the rest of the day so he could go home in case Colleen called again that day, but she didn't. He had the police trace the call, but all they got was the location of a gas station in Chico, which didn't help them. Three months later, Colleen was allowed to write her family a few letters, and then she called them again on Christmas Eve. She was still only able to tell them small fragments about her life, but at least they knew that she was alive and seemingly healthy. On Christmas Day, Colleen was surprised to find out that the hookers had gotten her a present. She unwrapped the gift and found that they had gotten her a new sleeping bag. She had been laying on her sleeping bag inside the box ever since she was kidnapped, and over the past year she had been allowed to sleep in it in the back room. She had a chain around her neck that locked her to the toilet, but it was much more comfortable than the cramped box. 1980 to 1981 is what Colleen referred to as her year out. She was able to hang out outside and tend to the garden, go jogging, have a job, and talk to her family. But the relationship between her and Jan was not well, and Cameron knew it. He decided that he needed to put Colleen back in the box, but first he was going to let her visit her family. He told her that he had gotten permission from the company, but they would be closely watched. He had her say goodbye to the neighbors a week before they left, and then kept her hidden. That way, the neighbors would believe she left on her own to go back to live with her mother in Riverside. They were already under the impression that she was staying with them temporarily anyway. Colleen was hidden in the box for a week before Cameron let her out and gave her a test. He needed to test her loyalty before he could take her to see her family. He told her to kneel, and then he pulled out a shotgun and told her to put the barrel in her mouth. She did. Then he told her to pull the trigger. She didn't know if the gun was loaded or not. All she knew was that her best option was always to obey, so she pulled the trigger. Click. She passed the test. 
On March 20, 1981, Cameron drove Colleen down to Riverside to visit her family. The story was that he was her fiancé, Mike, and that he was going to a computer convention in San Diego, so he was dropping her off for a visit. He would drop her off on Friday afternoon and pick her up the following afternoon. Cameron actually just stayed in a nearby motel that night. First, they stopped in Sacramento at a group of office buildings. Cameron told Colleen that this was the company's headquarters and they may want her to take a few tests. As she waited for him in the car, she wondered what kind of tests they might make her take. But as Cameron returned, he said she was lucky. They were too busy to see her and they could go. He handed her a small card that he said was a permit to carry money. He told her that if someone from the company caught her with money on her and not a permit, the punishment would be severe. While Colleen was at her father's house, her sisters and mother were all there. They didn't pry about her absence because it turned out that they all believed she was in a cult and they didn't want to push her away. Her loss of weight, her pale skin, her lack of communication, it was obvious to everyone that she was in a cult. She spent the night at her father's house and stayed up late talking to Bonnie. She would later say that she came so close to telling her the truth, but she was so afraid that the company would end up doing to her family what Cameron had done to her that she just couldn't. In the morning, the whole family joined her grandmother at church before visiting Colleen's aunt and having lunch. Before Colleen knew it, Cameron was back to pick her up. He introduced himself to the family as Colleen's fiancé, and when the camera came out, Colleen put her arms around Cameron and tried to play the part. The picture would later be used in court to try to convince a jury that Colleen wasn't a kidnapping victim. Once back at the trailer, with Jan and the kids staying at her mother's house, Cameron took the opportunity to make Colleen shower before he raped her and sealed her back in the box. March 21, 1981 was the last day of Colleen's year out. Colleen would spend the next three years in the box, only coming out to eat and be subjected to torture. Over the next three years, being released to eat was not a daily occurrence anymore. She said she probably ate four or five times a week on average. The lack of vitamins and sunlight made her skin even more pale and her hair started falling out. She was down to about 95 pounds. Once the family took off for two days and didn't leave her any food or water. The next time they took a trip for a three-day weekend and left Colleen in the box with a mason jar of water and some cookies. At the beginning of 1984, Colleen began gaining her freedoms once again. They started with longer periods of time out of the box at night. Cameron and Jan had begun reading the Bible in an effort to repair their relationship. They confessed their transgressions to each other. Jan told Cameron that she had had a couple of affairs, and Cameron confessed to having sex with Colleen during his torture sessions. Colleen would later say that the rape suddenly stopped at one point, and it was probably at this time. After their confessions to each other, they began using religion to repair their relationship. Jan would bring Colleen out of the box a couple of times a day to help with chores and talk about the Bible. One of the few possessions the hookers allowed Colleen to have was a Bible. In May of 1984, Colleen was again let out of the box full-time. She was reintroduced to their daughters and the neighbors under the pretense of, Hey look, Kay's back. They told people that her name was Kay, as in K-A-Y, to match her slave name. The reason for her release was so that she could once again get a job and bring money back into the household. Not long after, Cameron gave Colleen permission to start going to church, and soon after, Jan started going with her. Cameron and Jan were beginning to interpret the Bible in very different ways. Jan was starting to doubt her complacency in Colleen's slavery. She was having a very deep crisis of conscience over what they were doing to the young woman. Cameron, on the other hand, had used some passages from the Bible to justify having sex with Colleen. He basically thought the Bible was telling him that he should have two wives and they should both obey him. So the rapes began again, and now Cameron wanted Jan to be involved at the same time. Jan's struggle became that much worse when she realized that Colleen had become her closest friend. When Jan got sick, Colleen stayed home and took care of her. They discussed the Bible together. They went to church together. To top it off, Cameron was now talking about capturing more slaves. She was becoming more and more anxious that her children would find out about the true nature of their relationship with Colleen, and now Cameron wanted to add more slaves? As time went on, it became clear to Janice that Cameron believed that he already had two slaves. She couldn't take it anymore. 
Finally, Jan broke, and she went to see Colleen while she was at work. She told the young woman that Cameron wasn't part of the company. For some reason, she said that the company was real, but Cameron wasn't a member. Colleen thinks that she might have thought it would scare her into not going to the police. Either way, they both left the motel where Colleen worked and went to the church where they told the pastor the truth. The man of God had a hard time understanding exactly what the women were telling him. He was experienced counseling people about average problems in their jobs, marriages, and finances. He knew nothing about slaves and torture. Since it was time for Jan to pick up Cameron from work, they went home for the night and pretended like everything was normal. The next day, the women packed up and took the girls with them to Jan's parents' house. Jan asked her to stay with her and suggested they continue taking care of the girls away from Cameron, but Colleen knew she needed to be completely free of the hookers. She called her dad who, after not hearing from her for more than three years after her visit, wired her money for a bus ticket and Colleen fled to Riverside. Before she got on the bus, she called Cameron and told him she was leaving. She told him that she knew he lied and there was nothing he could do to stop her. She said he was crying on the other line when she said goodbye and hung up. After more than seven years of pain and torture, Colleen was finally free. After a few days of begging Jan to return home, she finally gave in and returned to Cameron. He told her he would change and that he would give up bondage, anything to have another chance. Jan believed him. He began going to church with her, and even though both the pastor and Jan's parents were told the truth about Colleen, neither of them said anything. They didn't report it to the police, nothing. As far as they were both concerned, it was a private marital problem and was none of their business. Colleen initially kept in touch with Jan, who told her Cameron was going to change, and convinced her that he deserved a second chance to do that for some unknown reason. Though Colleen's family urged her to go to the police, she refused, honoring her agreement with Jan to give Cameron the chance to change. Though the bondage and torture stopped, Cameron quickly stopped his efforts to change. Jan knew that he was a lost cause and finally reported Colleen's kidnapping and enslavement to police. But that wasn't all. Detective Al Shamblin went to the church where he had set up a time to meet with a woman named Janice Hooker. When he sat down with the woman, who was visibly shaken, she started telling him about an abduction that was carried out by her husband, Cameron Hooker. But this abduction happened in January of 1976, a year and a half before Colleen's abduction. She and her husband had gone out to the town of Chico, California, and picked up a young woman named Marie Elizabeth Spanicky, who went by Marlez. She said that they took the 19-year-old girl back to their home where Cameron tied her up and ended up strangling her to death. The following day, they buried her body near Lassen Park, east of Red Bluff. After calling the Chico Police Department and confirming that there was a report of a 19-year-old named Marlis Spanicky who went missing on January 31, 1976, they turned their attention to Colleen's story. Jan told them the entire story, at one point comparing Cameron to Jim Jones. Once Detective Shamblin finished verifying some of the details locally, he flew down to Riverside and talked to Colleen. Detective Shamblin arrived at Colleen's dad's house on November 12, 1984. Colleen told the detective everything that had happened over the seven years she was held by Cameron. The kidnap, the boxes, the torture, the slave contract, and the story about the company. She explained that Jan had asked her not to go to the police when she was finally free to give him a chance to change. She said now, if he's not going to change, she wanted to make sure that he wouldn't do it to anyone else. On November 18, 1984, Cameron Hooker was arrested at his home in Red Bluff, California. In preparation for the trial, Colleen was examined by a doctor so all of her scars could be documented. She measured an inch taller because of the stretcher, which also damaged her shoulder. She had scars on both of her wrists and one ankle. She had a scar on her labia, where Cameron had pierced it, claiming he was tagging her for the company. She had electrical burns on her thighs. Her hair was thinning, and her eyesight was damaged from years of darkness. She also had calluses on her body from laying in the box. After a preliminary hearing deemed there was enough evidence to charge Cameron Hooker with felony kidnapping with a weapon, seven counts of rape, three counts of false imprisonment, and a number of other horrific crimes, Tehama County decided that they couldn't afford to put him on trial. They planned on giving him a plea deal for a minor charge that would give him the possibility of freedom in less than five years. 
District Attorney Christine McGuire did her due diligence and found that the county's offer violated Penal Code Section 1192.7. It prohibits a plea bargain for a serious felony for any reason other than lack of evidence. The county could not legally offer Cameron a plea deal because they were broke. A few days later, the Assistant Attorney General of California called and made it clear that the county could not offer Cameron a plea deal. While Cameron was awaiting trial for crimes against Colleen, police investigated Jan's claims about the kidnap and murder of Marla's Spanicky, but they couldn't find the body or any other corroborating evidence to support the claim. Though she was most likely telling the truth, they weren't able to charge Cameron with the crime. Cameron Hooker's trial started on September 24, 1985 in Redwood City, California. After the district attorney finished describing the horror that Colleen lived through for over seven years, the defense presented their case. Cameron thought that he was clever and tried to claim that the statute of limitations for kidnapping were up since they were only seven years at the time, but the district attorney pointed out that the statute of limitations started counting down at the end of the kidnapping. Colleen was kidnapped the entire time she was with Cameron, so the clock only started a year prior. The defense also argued that once the hookers moved into the mobile home, Colleen was no longer held against her will since she was free to come and go as she pleased. Clearly, they don't understand what as she pleased means. This argument is very short-sighted, though. Being held against your will doesn't have to mean physically restrained. If I tell you that you have to stay with me or else I'll kill your family, that's considered being held against your will. Sure, you can physically come and go, but at the end of the day, you have to come back to me even though you don't want to in order to prevent something bad happening to your family. Colleen was told that she would be hunted down and tortured to death if she tried to escape, so she always returned to the trailer. That certainly shouldn't be considered free to come and go as you please. They also used the picture of Colleen with her arms around Cameron from her visit home and some letters she wrote to him as evidence that she was in love with her captor, showing their complete lack of understanding of psychology. Using the actions of someone who has spent years being physically and mentally tortured isn't really a solid defense in the long run. Janice testified against her husband and got immunity from any crimes. Though she did participate in the kidnapping and slavery of Colleen, she was also abused and brainwashed by Cameron. After Jan, Colleen testified. This was the first time her family was hearing the full extent of what was done to her during the seven years as Cameron Hooker's slave. Most of the claims during the testimonies came down to Cameron's word against Jan and Colleen's. But once the DA brought out the various torture devices, as well as the head box and the box that Colleen lived in, the jury realized the seriousness of what the defendant had done. Possibly because the evidence against Cameron was so damning, the defense decided to put him on the stand. Cameron openly admitted to kidnapping Colleen, something he believed he couldn't be punished for. Then he launched into a story about how Colleen was high on drugs when he kidnapped her. He said he only hung her for about five minutes that night because she started crying, so he took her down. After a few days in his basement, he felt bad about what he had done and was going to let her go, but she said she'd go to the police. He also claimed that he could tell she was going through withdrawals and she kept asking for some pills from her purse. Colleen would later clarify that the pills she was asking for were her birth control pills because she was expecting Cameron to rape her, which he eventually did. Cameron continued his story, describing how he cared for Colleen for two weeks as she detoxed, and that he hadn't done any more bondage to her during that time. He claimed that after she stopped having withdrawals, it was her idea to try more bondage. On top of that, Cameron claimed that Colleen asked him multiple times why he wasn't having sex with her, implying that she wanted him to. Then he said that the first time they did have sex, he asked her first and she gave him permission. Then he claimed that he offered to take her to Riverside in September of 1978, but she told him she wanted to stay. Yeah, sure she did. The strange part of Cameron's testimony was that he told the truth about most of the seven years that Colleen was held captive. He admitted that he kidnapped her. He admitted that he locked her in a crate the first night, then onto the rack, and then he built the box. He admitted that they put her to work in the workshop. He admitted lying about the company and having her sign a contract under duress. He just peppered in lies that made it sound like Colleen was not being held against her will or being raped. 
Unfortunately for Cameron, the jury knew he was lying and those lies just reinforced how much of a horrible monster he actually was. Cameron Hooker was found guilty of kidnapping with a special circumstance of using a knife during the crime. He was found guilty of six counts of rape, with some of them having a special circumstance, such as use of force, violence, duress, and threat of immediate bodily harm. He was sentenced to up to 25 years for the kidnapping, plus 5 to 10 years for using a knife, along with a total of 69 years for the rapes and unlawful imprisonment charges. The California Department of Corrections could keep Cameron Hooker in prison for up to 104 years. He was denied parole in 2015, and his next parole hearing should have been in 2030. But due to COVID, parole officials announced that they wanted to parole him in March of 2021. Due to an overwhelming outcry against that, Cameron has been assigned a temporary label of sexually violent predator, which means he would be required to be sent to a psychiatric hospital upon his release, indefinitely. He will be having a trial later this year to determine if that will happen, which it absolutely should. I mean, what should really happen is that he should be granted parole and then have to live in a box in Colleen Stan's basement for the rest of his pathetic life. But unfortunately, the state doesn't let me punish people anymore. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.